So to start this, let's draw inspiration on how business can be a force for good. And it's my absolutely pleasure to welcome on stage our keynote speaker, Lubomila Jordanova, the CEO of Plan A, who is an inspiration for all of us. Today I want to talk about a misconception that is widely available across the economy. And that is actually what is the value of a product. When you think about a product, you might think about sales, about marketing, you might think about materials. But let's be honest, neither sustainability nor decarbonization is part of the day-to-day -day planning of businesses. Maybe in the past. The product value chain of any physical product is actually incredibly complex. And we all know, to have a t-shirt that someone of you here is wearing, it takes a lot of incredibly complex steps that need to be aligned, that cost, and that require for a business to be mindful of how much do they spend against how much do they make. You have the materials, you have the distribution, the transportation, you have also the possibility to make money, but not always the same amount. These days, in an economic situation where not every single business is seeing the growth that they've been experiencing for the last few years, the question remains, is actually the value of a product what truly is well understood by the business leaders that we work with or we are? Well, what a business would hope for is that a value chain is stable. You calculate how much does it cost to have the materials, you calculate how much is the transportation, you calculate how much is every single step of the marketing journey of your business, and then you expect sales. Sales at the highest level of the margin, but sometimes sales at a discount, maybe sales that also leads to no sales where products like in the fashion industry, for example, quite significantly, sometimes even up until 50%, end up on the landfill because of overproduction. If a value chain is stable, the expectation of the business is that its revenue is stable. But the headlines today, anywhere you look across the world, confirm that the revenue is not to be predicted so easily these days because all of us are interlinked, all of us contribute to the value chain in a different way, some with the materials, some with the marketing, and somehow, in an economic situation like the one we have now, the reality doesn't allow for this predictability. One thing, though, that we all know is that we have a crisis that has been predicting itself thanks to the work of a lot of scientists, some of which are even here, extensively over the last few decades. Just over the last 40, 50 years, we have seen a few hundred percent increase in climate risk-related costs. These costs at the moment, you might feel, are not paid by us. You might feel that they're not paid by your business, and you might be thinking, oh, maybe I need to do some ESG reporting and then I've ticked off the box of what my responsibility for this crisis is. However, when you dive into the data, which is what we do with my team extensively, you start seeing that this cost is actually distributed across the whole society. It's paid by governments when there's a flood. It's paid by businesses when a factory gets destroyed. It's paid by the individuals that maybe lose their house because of another natural disaster. What often is forgotten, though, is that we have other KPIs that supposedly maybe don't look at climate, but progressively are being affected by every single decision that we make that is in one way or another against the health of our planet. Another confirmation that has been extensively showing its face to us 
is the numbers about the emissions on this planet. According to the UN, we need to be reducing emissions at 7% on a yearly basis. Potentially not news to anyone that is sitting here. Potentially news for people that are not here that continue to contribute to a reality where we don't see any more the reduction, but rather continuous increase. The only year when we actually had the decrease in the emissions happened during COVID, and it was exactly 7%. Governments are not silly. They know how to think about this challenge. And they have been extensively showing different ways in which they engage with the topic, be it through activation of alliances, be it through legislation. The legislation shift over the last few years has been wild for many businesses because they had to navigate realities where within one single report, certain corporates would have to put together a list of 1,100 KPIs. And when you think about that many KPIs, you're thinking, well, probably a business is thinking about this value chain in a bit of a concerned manner because they're wildly excited about growth in their revenue, but they all of a sudden need to think about becoming experts in bird migration or in energy efficiency. The beauty of the reality of this legislative shift is that there has been a lot of understanding of the value that science brings to the table. Regardless if you're not a sustainability expert, which many of us here are, there is an opportunity for anyone that is maybe misinformed or not informed to go into the data and start understanding that the depth of the success of their business is heavily dependent on the reality in which they understand that every single KPI associated to CO2 is actually their allowance to continue existing. Given the audience here, I probably wouldn't need to allow myself to explain what scope one, two, and three, but in a nutshell, what this mathematical model gives us is the opportunity for every single one of us to identify the business activities that we have in a translatable also for the financial world manner. And if we go into this financial world, actually we have another indicator that has been there to show us that we need to start thinking a bit more progressively about the correlation between money, growth, CO2, margins, sales, revenue. This is the global GDP as it has been looking for the last decade. Not a beautiful picture, isn't it? And if this is the growth that we want to be able to see in order to develop our projects, probably we're mixing up somewhere the equation and some KPIs are missing in order for us to know how to enable the success, not only for ourselves, but also for the value chain participants that we work with, be it suppliers, be it the employees, be it the other stakeholders that matter to the existence of any economic contributor. So it becomes evident from this little mathematical equation that we did that financial KPIs without the contribution of non-financial KPIs are not allowing us to really be truly aligned to the success that we want to see in this world and in this economy. However, while I can be maybe convincing, hopefully, uh, of why this matters, Maybe it is useful to go into every single one of the steps of this challenge to the economy and understand where the problem truly is. For the last seven years, with my company Plan A, we've been studying legislation, we've been studying science, uh, we've built a scientific team, we've also built a decarbonization team, as well as also extensive uh, relationships with more than 1,500 clients, who came to us with a simple request, which was, how do we stay relevant to an economy that is shifting in a legislative reality that is confusing in a setup where a complex value chain is heavily dependent on third parties that are even outside of our scope? And when we did the analysis, not for some of them, but more on a general level for how the economy would look, we now have legislation uh, or actual challenges associated to 
access to raw materials. We have emission penalties for the transportation that businesses have. We have legislation that is coming for how you are becoming more sustainable. And even two weeks ago, France announced that there will be financial penalties for ultra-fast fashion companies because this is somehow becoming a burden to an economy that is shifting. What does this mean back to the topic of revenue? At the end of the day, it might sound a little bit cynical. We all need to be understanding that the reason why many businesses have become big is because they found a way to make the equation of how much money am I spending on these raw materials versus how much my marketing is going to help me to be able to sell. In today's reality, and combined with the statistic that I mentioned of overproduction, we are looking into an equation that finishes with a question mark. And it is only for the businesses that decide to actually be at the forefront of the shift to decarbonize, to be on top of the legislation, the allowance to exist will be true. How does an industry stay relevant? Out of all of the companies that we've been working with, and these are companies of the likes of Chloe, BMW, Ghani, even the European Commission, we have understood that there are several key factors for an industry and for a business within this industry to stay relevant. If you want to be able to keep your employees happy, start working on sustainability. If you want to see growth in revenue, also start working on sustainability or add it to your vision and to the work that you're doing with the different projects that you manage. What is probably the most important revelation we've gathered from working with all these different businesses has been that CO2 is actually money. And this is a KPI that, if not in the back of the mind of a board member, a C-level, it might conflict them in the next steps of the growth that they're anticipating. When we looked into these 1,500 companies uh, over the last few years, what we have seen is actual steps that businesses need to take in order to understand their part, their status quo, also the stage at which their business is at the moment in the context of sustainability. It is about team awareness. It is about becoming literate in terms of the calculations that you need to do. It is about understanding who from your suppliers is actually requiring education in order to become more sustainable and fastly support you on this net zero goal that you've set for yourself and maybe has been set even by your investor. And it is also about the ecosystem approach that one takes, where a business might decide to be at the forefront of the shift, but they are never going to be able to do it by themselves because every single stakeholder matters. When I found Plan A in 2016, I found myself in a bit of a special situation where sustainability was a topic sometimes banned by the discussion, sometimes a bit of it unavailable because the education level of people was different. Since then, we've made the big decision to actually go inside these value chains, inside these stakeholder engagement discussions, in order to allow businesses like BMW and the logos that you see here to understand how by becoming more sustainable they can save money, they can make more money, but it comes at the cost of the action that they take to engage their board, their employees, and also every single stakeholder that matters to the existence of their business. Even the logistics partner that you might not know yet doesn't understand CO2, doesn't understand scope one, two, and three. What has been most exciting is that we're starting to see the results. And for these big numbers of 1,500, I've decided to take three examples that have been, in my view, incredibly impressive because they've given us a lot of comfort that even in a complex environment where we might be considering certain industries slow, there's actually a lot of action that is being taken. KFC is one of our clients and they were using spreadsheets. <laughs> These spreadsheets were a lot, and there was a lot of data hidden in them. What we ended up doing was actually supporting them to digitize their experience and also being able to create a community of climate leaders within their company in the hundreds 
that are pushing for the decarbonization legislation to be implemented on behalf of the company. Another example that I always pride myself on because I'm never going to forget actually the sales call that I had with Lauren, that is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Ghani, when we were three, five people in the company. She said at the end when they decided to start working with us, she was like, you're the only company that is actually talking about insetting. You're the only company that is talking about decarbonization, not just compensation. What they've done since, beyond the fact that they've assessed their emissions and they've looked into their value chain, they've started supporting even financially their suppliers to switch their energy so that they become more sustainable and ultimately for the emissions in scope three to be reduced, is that they've started innovating. This jacket that you see here is actually made out of kombucha bacteria. It took 10 years for the material to be developed and now this jacket not only exists, but it's also cool. Another thing that they did was actually start using mushrooms. They have their own lab, Materials of the Future, where they're looking into how they can utilize nature, but in a mindful for nature manner, to be able to essentially build products that are exciting for the audiences, but are also good for the planet. And a final example that I uh, pride myself extensively on as we've been working with them again since we were three, four people in the company is BMW. BMW last year came to us with a challenge, which was build us a product that is going to able to give us the chance to decarbonize the fleets of our corporate clients. This product is now in 11 different markets in 11 different languages and is ultimately allowing for people that are using already the BMW platform to go in and not only see what kind of cars they have, but also be able to see what are the CO2 emissions, download an ESG report, and also start seeing what kind of cars they need to switch to in order to reduce their own emissions and ultimately reduce the emissions of their companies, which, as we know, depending on where the fleet is sitting, uh, either scope one, two, or three. The biggest learning that I've gathered over these years of working on Plan A has been the fact that we might be a group here of people that meet each other on a yearly basis, but the truth is we have the day after change now where we need to go back to our day-to-day -day activities and be excited about a world that is shifting a little bit faster, that is moving a little bit faster. And especially with the statistics that have been coming up in the last few years, I think it is of utmost importance for us to understand that not a single day is anymore allowed for us to actually don't identify ourselves as the change makers that are required for this planet, but also for this economy to continue to exist. Thank you.